uh, stand with me uh, and turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 6. We've been working through the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, and we'll begin again reading, and then we're going to, we'll read this, but then we'll pray it right after that as well. So let's, uh, let's begin reading um, at verse 9 when you've got it. This is a life-changing prayer. Uh, sometimes we just say it um, out of kind of uh, tradition um, and don't think a lot about it, but if you really pray this prayer from your heart, you will never be the same. Never, ever be the same. So with that in mind, this is how you should pray according to Jesus. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And who is that? Jesus. And we need Jesus to do verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we also forget, have forgiven our debtors. And I like, like how it says this in, in Luke 4. It says, forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And notice how Jesus wraps this up. And this is what we're going to look at today. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But this is a scary part, what comes next. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Yeah. So grab somebody's hand next to you and let's, uh, let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, review as we've been working through the Lord's Prayer and going over the 12 steps as they fit uh, so clearly together. And so let's uh, review. We're going to go through step nine this morning. So step one, we admitted we were pow powerless over our sin, our idols, that our lives have become unmanageable. That, that's what drives us to prayer because we can't do this. That's why Jesus knew the disciples needed to learn prayer and this prayer because life's too crazy and we need somebody, step two, who's greater than ourselves, came to believe that Abba Father, who is greater than ourselves, could restore us to sanity, that most important relationship, that father relationship. He's the one who restores us. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand him. Tough one. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. The Holy Spirit began to look and show us and reveal idols and struggles and battles and addictions. Then we admitted to God ourselves, to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Step six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects, these idols, these sins. Then humbly ask God, this is what we looked at last week, humbly ask God to remove our sins. 
And today we want to look at eight and nine. Made a list of all the persons we have harmed. Become willing to make amends, reconciliation, restoration with them. And then nine, made direct amends, process of forgiveness, being forgiven and forgiving others and seeking forgiveness to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. If I had only one sermon to preach uh, to the body and 10 minutes to do it, uh, what would I pick? One message, 10 minutes to do it, uh, knowing that this is your last message, this is my last message that we'll ever hear uh, on earth, it would be on forgiveness. 95% and maybe even higher of all the counseling that I've done over the years has to do with forgiveness and issues of forgiveness and unforgiveness. The crux of, of this prayer is bringing us to the table to live in relationship with God and with others. To me, this is the greatest picture of the church of Jesus Christ. And it's all about relationship. It's all about this relationship with the Father that we started the prayer with, our Father. And then it brings us to the section where God forgive us so that we can also forgive others so that we can live in this relationship of love together around Jesus, around the one who has given his life to bring us to this table so that we can experience incredible peace, incredible shalom. I asked Jeremy to move the cross up, uh, up forward. It's, it's been in back, but we just want to focus on the cross a little bit this morning. And um, at the top of the cross, we want to look at that, that beam that's going down, that, that vertical relationship, and today the horizontal relationship. But everything starts with this vertical relationship. And you remember when Jesus uh, was put on the cross, Pilate put this big sign up there that said what? King of the Jews. And we want to put up there this morning, King of the world. How did Jesus become the King of the world? the king of our lives, the king of Chino and the Inland Empire, the king over America, the king over Africa and South America, the king over absolutely everything. How did Jesus become king? In two ways. First of all, it's already up there, right? So, you know, he became by this, this being a selfless sacrifice. Two reasons why Jesus became king of the world. The first is, He became a selfless sacrifice. And one of the passages, and we read it this morning as we gathered to pray as elders, is found in Philippians 2, verse 5, where Paul is saying uh, we should have the same attitude that Christ showed by coming to earth. And when Christ came to the earth, he had this attitude. He became a servant. He emptied himself of all heaven's glory, all his majesty, taking the form of a man. He became flesh and blood. He became a servant, emptied himself of all the riches of heaven, emptied himself of his relationship of perfection with the Father. And now he lived among us. And he showed himself ultimately as a servant by his death on the cross. And God was so pleased with his sacrifice. God was so blessed by his sacrifice that he uh, raised the son up. That at the name, Philippians 2 says, at the name of Jesus Christ, what will every knee do? Bow. Heaven, earth, and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So God was so pleased with this selfless sacrifice of his son on the cross that he raised him up and at the name of Jesus, every knee 
will bow in heaven, earth, below the earth. And every tongue will confess, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, the night before he went to the cross and showed that selfish sacrifice, he, he wanted to show the disciples what that looked like. And we called it the Last Supper, but really it should be the First Supper. Because again, as I said earlier, this is the greatest picture of the church of Jesus Christ right here. And so here Jesus, he's sitting over here, actually probably laying, but we'll just say sitting. But he's sitting over here as the father of the meal. He's hosting the meal. And it says in John 13 that as he's hosting the meal, as they're eating together, Jesus gets up, takes off his what? Robe. So he's in his underwear and he, and he puts a towel around him. Then what does Jesus do? Gets down on his knees. This is the king of glory who gets down on his knees and he begins washing dirty disciples' feet. And remember, Peter says, no, you can't do this. And, and they just said, you know, if I don't do this, you're in trouble, right? And so Jesus shows the full extent of his love. The text says, Jesus shows that servant heart because his goal is to keep us here at this table. And, and so Jesus is going around and he's, he's washing feet over this end at the table is a man named Judas, right? And John chapter 13 says, at this point, Satan had already entered the heart of Judas. So Jesus is working his way around the table and he comes to Judas. How do you think that went? Think that was easy for Jesus? In a few hours, this guy is going to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. I don't think it was easy for Jesus, but, but Jesus is showing us what the church looks like. Jesus is showing us the power of the table. And it's about even forgiving our enemies, even serving our enemies. And later in John chapter 3, he says, they'll, they'll know you are my disciples by what? By how you love. And so Jesus became king because he was this selfless sacrifice. Then he goes to the cross. And now he doesn't take off his robe. They take off his robe. And here's the second reason why I believe that that, that Jesus is the king of the world, it's because of the words that he said on the cross. Father, forgive them because they know not what they're doing. And I thought about this week of maybe people that were watching Jesus being crucified uh, that day. And when Jesus, he says these words, Father, forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing. And I think of a, of a young mother that's there and her child died and she's angry. And maybe even taking some of her anger out on Jesus, right? Because heard a lot about this guy, that this guy could heal, that this guy could raise the dead. What about my daughter? Why didn't you do that for her? And her anger maybe projected uh, off the, the, what was going on and, and, and projected onto Jesus. Or maybe the Roman soldier who was there, who had been apart from his wife for a long time. He's in this stinking little place called Jerusalem where these people are angry and violent. He has to sit here watching this slave, watching this prisoner die. And he's thinking about his wife back in Rome. Is she being faithful? Is she keeping true to me or has she found another man? And he's there and he's going through heartache and pain. And Jesus cries out, Father, forgive them. Or the Pharisee who might have been there and 
He's lived a righteous life, a good life. He's kept the law. He's tried to be an example to his family, but his oldest son had kind of just taken off, became rebellious, immoral lifestyle, and he's thinking to himself, what did I do wrong? My son is shaming me, and he's shaming himself, and he's shaming God. What did I do wrong? And Jesus cries out, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. And you're here this morning and some of you are engaged, some of you are not engaged, some of you love Jesus, some of you are bitter, some of you believe, some of you don't believe. And Jesus still cries out from this table, Father, forgive them, forgive them. If Jesus didn't shout out those words, you and I would not be here today. None of us. If Jesus chose to be bitter and chose to be angry, and chose to say, you know, all my my disciples, they've abandoned me, and I'm not going to do this for them. He won't be king, we won't be here, and the world, who knows what would have happened. But the fact is that he forgave, and that, that vertical relationship, and that's what the table is all about and and it leads then when we understand his selfless sacrifice and and his forgiveness and his grace for sinners then it leads to this horizontal understanding when we receive that forgiveness and that grace then we're called to live in relationship with other people that that we forgive Jesus says as you've been forgiven and again, in that passage in Luke chapter 11, 4, he says, Father, forgive my sins, take them away. And that, that word means to be taken off the hook. Don't hold it against me as I forgive everyone who sins against me. When we understand this vertical relationship and and Jesus has forgiven us of our sins it leads to this horizontal relationship where we forgive others that we give them grace and we give them mercy Jesus told the parable after Peter asked the question remember Peter said hey Jesus how many times should I forgive somebody And, and what did Peter say seven right It's a good number, right? Seven is a good number. Seven times. What does Jesus respond to Peter? Seven times seven, which is a lot of sins, right? But Jesus says infinitely, you're called to, to keep forgiving, to keep forgiving, to keep forgiving. And then he tells this parable of this king who, who brings his servants in and says, let's, let's uh, take care of all your accounts. And there was this servant that, that if you add up the numbers, he, he owes like $6 billion to the king. And he comes and he gets down on his knees and he pleads and he begs, oh, I'll try to pay back every last penny. Please don't throw me in jail. Please don't, don't, don't put my family in jail. Let me try to pay you back. And the king says, okay, let's, let's get your account. Let's see it. King writes a note and says it is paid in full. Six billion dollars paid in full. Nice, huh? That'd be good if we could do that to our government. Trillion dollars paid in full. And then that that servant who's had his debt totally paid for, six billion dollars, has a servant come to him who owes just, just a few hundred dollars. Remember what he does? He lets him off the hook, right? He, he, he grabs him by the throat and he just begins to curse him. And he's grabbing him, he's shaking him, and he's demanding his hundred dollars be paid back. And, and he can't, the guy can't do it. He throws him in jail. And the servants, the other servants hear about this. They, they go to the master, the king, and the report what happened. The king says, you foolish and wicked servant. You cried out and I wiped your debt clean and your your six billion dollars, it's taken away. 
and you couldn't forgive him a hundred dollars. Throw him in prison until he pays back every last penny. And then Jesus says this incredible statement, this will happen to you if you don't forgive others their sins. Now, last week we talked about justification by faith, right? October 31 was what? Reformation Day. 95 theses, right? Not 99, 95 theses, Wittenberg. We talked about this glorious from Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2, that man, we are credited righteous before God when we believe he does not hold our sins against us. And then here in that, that passage of, of Matthew 18, and here in Matthew 6, Jesus says the same thing. If you do not forgive them their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. What's going on? This glorious truth of Reformation theology, justification by faith, which is really Roman theology, which is really Jesus theology, that you're saved by grace through faith, not by of your works, not of your deeds. It is a gift of God. But when you understand that gift of grace, you give grace away. What happens when you and I don't forgive? Now, we get offended for all different reasons by people. Sometimes people hurt us and they don't even know they're hurting us, right? It's, it's not intentional. There are other people in our lives that it is intentional, right? It is intentional. They know exactly what they're doing. Forgiveness you know, C.S. Lewis said, forgiveness is the most beautiful word in the Bible until you have to forgive somebody. And Jesus knows the table is about fellowship. And he came and the father brought the son and broke his body, shed his blood because the father loved you so much that he wants you in relationship with him. So he sent his son and we're in a few minutes, we're going to eat him and drink him. Because this is the, the picture that God wants us to be. He wants us to be in relationship with the father. This is the greatest relationship that you need right here. Some of my greatest memories as a, as a kid have been at the table. Uh, literally at home, grandma's house, pot roast dinners, right? Um, Thanksgiving, some of my most painful memories of a child has also been at tables. And when there's bitterness or anger or unforgiveness around the table, everybody feels it. As a boy, just five years old, and dad would come home late and, you know, drinking, and, and, and we were kids, we would know, we'd, nobody would have to say anything, the tension, the pain. But God wants to bring us to this table where he's the father and the son, we eat and drink the son, and there's shalom around the table, not only with the father, but with the family. And what happens when we don't let somebody off the hook, when we don't forgive them, whether it's unintentionally or they intentionally hurt us, here's what happens. Father's still here, family's still here, but unforgiveness, we kind of move out of the, the, the family table. Paul says in Ephesians chapter four that when we have bitterness or anger in our heart, we quench the Holy Spirit. If you come here this morning and you're bitter or you're angry or you're resentful, chances are that this isn't going to mean a whole lot to you. What happens is we, we pull ourselves from the table. This is what you need the most. You need to hear your father say, I love you. He doesn't move. He stays the same. Who moves out of the table? We move out of the table. And over time, uh, we get farther away from the table. And then Hebrews 12, 15 says, bitter roots start to form around our hearts. 
So we're getting farther from the voice that we need, farther from the family of God, and bitter roots grow. You put layers over your hearts. And so instead of love relationship that you need so desperately, bitterness takes over. Do you ever do the three-legged race when you're kids? Anyone ever do the three-legged? I hated that thing. Because they would always put you with, they put me with like the slowest girl, right? (laughs) And and so you had your hook to that person. And, you know, I'm just a little competitive or I used to be a little competitive. And I wanted to win that race, but they matched you up, usually at least with me, a slow girl. And so you're hooked to her and you're trying to win the race. and, And she's like back here and you're pulling her and she falls, guess what? You fall, right? Hated that game. (laughs) The, The same thing is true with unforgiveness. If I don't forgive somebody else, that person is chained to me. I will take that person wherever I go. That person will slow me down. That person will beat me up. That person will not allow me to do the things God has called me to be. We quench the spirit. We need the anointing of God's love more than anything else. Bitter roots are tied around our legs. And then finally, we move so far from that table that we go way, way back to the back row right here. And not only is our relationship affected with God, and I'm not feeling his presence or anointing, it begins to affect all my other relationships. See, I I really believe that wounded people will wound other people. And many times when we're wounded, even as a young person, and, you know, by a father or a mother or a relative, And we don't know what to do with that and bitterness gets in there and we hide our hearts and we become people who wound other people. And the only way to break that is through forgiveness. And what happens, we move so far away from God that we begin to hurt other people. Alcoholics know that really, really well. One of my greatest memories, my mom will be here in the second service and uh, going to celebrate her birthday today. But one of my greatest memories, as my dad worked step eight and nine, you really have to humble yourself because you have to, you have to admit, these are the things I've done wrong. These are the people that I've hurt. One day he called my mom up and said, Harriet, um, I need to come talk to you. And he came over to the house and he did step eight and step nine. And he said, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? Up to that point, we'd have like gatherings in in a, a year before that, Patty and I got married. And you know when there's divorce in the home and there's not reconciliation, that can make the marriage time really funny. Dad's on this side, mom's on this side, and there's no shalom in the middle. But a year later, as God did a miracle in my father's heart and he understood God's forgiveness and God's grace, He then sought forgiveness. That's the other part of that that cross. You seek forgiveness. And you seek forgiveness of the people that you hurt. And as my dad did that and asked my mom for forgiveness, my brother forgiveness, my sister for forgiveness, me for forgiveness, shalom was restored. The presence of God was restored in relation. So dad could come to my graduation from seminary and be in the same house with my mom and um, there was shalom, there was peace after years of pain. And notice what Jesus says in, in the Sermon on the Mount earlier. 
chapter 5, look at verse 21. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift, right? When we know forgiveness and we begin to let others off the hook because Jesus has given us so much grace, And we seek then to live in relationship with other people that maybe there's people in our life that we have hurt or uh, we've walked away from a son or a daughter that we have not called in a long time because of bitterness or anger, because of our own failures. When we begin to understand this King Jesus who became this selfless sacrifice and He forgave us of all of the billions of our sins. And we begin to live in relationship of letting others off the hook and forgiving them and then restoring relationship. The presence of God comes and and this is what the world needs to see. The world needs to see homes in neighborhoods where there's shalom, amen? that it just flows out of your home. It, it flows out of your kids. You know, you, you teachers, you, you know, those of you who teach and, and been teaching for years that many of those kids that come into your classroom that, that are the troublemakers, and I was one of those, um, maybe something's not right at home, right? We see that a lot in the school systems today. But, but when we restore the home through Jesus Christ and his grace and his mercy and his love, we receive that and, and we know that we have to let other people off the hook. And then the church becomes what the church was meant to be. Wounded people healed by the wounded healer, Jesus Christ, who began to bring his love and his forgiveness and his grace to the world. I'm excited for uh, what God is doing uh, in our midst um, and what God has been doing uh, in this church. Um, I think about coming Oh, it's just been over six years ago. And I didn't realize, you know, you you always think you know what's going on. And, um, but I didn't realize the pain. People, people warned me and said, you know, you go to a situation like what cross point has been through and, um, you're not going to last. One guy, I was, remember, uh, where are you, Leon? Remember when we were at that prayer conference and I met Leon for the first time? We were at a prayer conference. There's a guy named Daniel Henderson who I, I really got to know. Uh, I was part of a prayer group, a pastor's prayer group in, uh, in Holland, Zeeland, Michigan. And he would come out and he would lead our um, retreats, pastor's prayer summits. And he was at, Leon, we were at this and Leon just heard that I was coming out here and, and Daniel pulled me aside and he says, you know, Tim, I I just, I've come out of a situation like you're coming into. And, you know, I've, I've been able to just make it two years and I'm, I'm leaving there. And so he says, you know, just guard your heart, be, be careful. Um, but you know, pride, you you know, I'll, I'll do okay. I'll do okay. And then, then I, I came here and there's pain and struggle. And I, I need to ask you for forgiveness because I didn't know how to handle all that always. And, you know, when you feel pain and you feel other people's pain and other people's displeasure, um, it's easy to hide or go inward or guard your heart. So I want to ask you forgiveness for those early years that I guarded my heart, that maybe I didn't love you the way I should have loved you. Um, 
and God's been working on my own heart there. Because Abba, Abba loves us and Abba loves me and Abba loves you. A few years ago, I said to you for the first time, it took me a while because I was guarding my heart, but for the first time I said, I love you. And I can say that from my heart, but I ask you to forgive me if I have sinned against you or if the staff has sinned against you or if the elders or deacons, if we unknowingly we have sinned against you because God is doing such a powerful work here. I wish you could all come to our covenant partners class and just hear people just cry. I mean, we had a huge group and they just cried because every one of them just about, and they didn't know why they're crying. We knew why they're crying because it's the Holy Spirit. But they come here and they feel the love of God, the presence of God. It's because of you. It's because of your grace. It's because of your mercy. And I believe it's just beginning. And as we learn to forgive each other and love each other and let each other off the hook, we, we, we're at the table. But if you come in on a Sunday morning and you're bitter and you're angry, the word's not really going to mean anything to you and the table's really not gonna be, what happens, you just get harder and harder and more bitter. And you know, the person who loses is you. You lose, you're, you're hooked to somebody else. And, and the greatest thing we can do is just forgive. You may not feel things right away, but your act of obedience like Jesus on the cross will, will let others free and will let you free. Yesterday I was working on my sermon, I was coming back from that. And we, the church is on Edison and Euclid, right? Right? And um, I was driving, pulling off Central to Edison. And you know, I, I've seen the power lines, we got so many power lines in this area, right? I, I've seen the power lines before, but this is your homework. When you go out on Edison next time, look at the power lines and look at what they're shaped like. Like the cross. And there's just not one beam, there's three beams. So I'm, never, yeah, I'm driving down Edison back to church and I'm looking at the power lines and I'm looking at, man, that looks like the cross and there's three levels and wow. And, and then I start thinking about cross point and this great big cross that's out in front of our church and how at every new members class, covenant partners class, people say we came here because we saw the big cross and God somehow brought us here. And I'm thinking about that, wow, and, and, I'm, and I'm driving up and looking, and there's, I mean, some of, somebody who's really anal, count how many there are. I mean, there are tons. What happens, though, when one of those power lines fall or a couple power lines fall? All that energy, all that power, it's cut off. And when I was driving, I'm thinking, you know, when, when there's sin, when there's unforgiveness, when there's bitterness, when there's judgment, what we do is we, the, the cross is nullified, the cross begins to fall in our lives and we're created to, to hold up that power line through the cross, through grace, through forgiveness and God's Holy Spirit then works through us and we bring the Holy Spirit and God's grace through our own unique ways to people that need to see the Father's love. And God has put this church on such a great corner. And, and then I looked, and if you go on um, Euclid, the same thing, up and down Euclid. And I think God has just given me a prophetic vision of what God has called this church to be. He's given you, the leaders of this church, some years ago, you built this huge, gigantic cross. John, we prayed a lot around that cross. And it is through forgiveness and through forgiving others that we become the vehicle of grace to a world that needs Jesus Christ so desperately. And so I believe that God is moving, God is working. And the challenge for us 
is that life of constant forgiveness. I forgive you, by the way, for making my hair gray and turning bald. <laughs> my brother has a full set of hair and he's older than me and it's blonde. Um, but grace is granting forgiveness. Grace is granting mercy. Grace is loving each other. And in your bulletin, there's 12 steps. And just take that home by a guy named Neil Anderson. And uh, I just challenge you to take that home. You're dealing with forgiveness. There's way more that we need to talk to, but we need to get to about, but we need to get to the table. But, but if you didn't get one of those, please get a bulletin, get one, take it home, put it in your Bible and start working those steps and, and making amends to the people that you have hurt so that we can be at the table, so that we can love well. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to just through your Holy Spirit right now, Show us if there is unforgiveness in our hearts. That person that keeps coming up, that father, that mother, that brother, that sister, that uncle that sexually abused you. That boss that looked over your hard work and your hours and hours you put into it and promoted somebody else instead of you. That husband that physically abused you or emotionally abused you. Your wife who had an affair. that teacher that spoke curses over your life instead of blessings. That child that walked away ungrateful. That pastor that failed to be a shepherd to you. Holy Spirit, give us the grace of the cross to pray the blood of Jesus Christ over that person or those people. Lord, we see that person right before us, right in front of us. And in our hearts we say, we forgive them for what they've done. And not only do we forgive them, but we pray that you would bless them. In the same way that you would bless us, that you would bless them. Lord, we're saying that out of raw obedience. We don't feel it. Maybe some of us, we don't feel it, but we're saying it out of raw obedience. Lord, we forgive them through the power of the cross. And all God's people said,